Happiness through curiosity on the Ranveer Show. Welcome to TRS Clips. I feel that the point of podcast is what your history books don't teach you anywhere in the world. Hmm. Uh, two questions, and we've brought this up in our previous podcast as well. Do you think that secret society slash Illuminati slash a small group of powerful individuals were actually responsible for these decisions? Because when you read about this in retrospect, where one guy getting killed sparked off an entire war, it can't be as simple as that. and they have to have been other motivations for people to go to war and often when countries go to war it does boost the economy like we've seen in the case of russia and ukraine uh so were there actual underlying economic angles to this that do you think according to you as a geopolitical observer as someone who's very well read about history what were the underlying intentions that we don't read about in history books so the first question is about illuminati the second question is um about this whole uh britain angle do you think even they wanted the war back then do you think that uh keeping all this whole imperialistic world in mind the colonies of the world uh what was britain's kind of game plan back then so let's come to britain first britain okay. was playing a defensive game they had a big empire mm. to manage they did not want to lose access to the empire and they needed access to certain choke points like suez uh, the persian gulf and and things like that they also were dependent on on oil from mesopotamia from kuwait from present day iraq that region so they had a big network they they administered about 1/4 of the world's geography and they it was a defensive game for that if things spiral out of control they will lose access to certain territories which will be a disaster for them because empire is what matters so britain was they did not want war okay they were trying to i mean they were actually isolated they did not care much but then they were trying to kind of uh, stop war if if possible right so that was their stance now illuminati and all that see the europe was a tinder box at the time in the it was a tinder box because of all these old rivalries and and um, ethnic enmities and feuds the ottoman empire had has had uh, converted certain populations in bosnia to a different religion to the islamic religion you had christians you had muslims in a certain region and you also had old rivalries between these families between these dynasties so they all so looked at each other with suspicion with jealousy with 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 enmity mm. and all it needed was a spark to set the whole thing mm. aflame kind of where the world stands right now with china possibly on the verge of invading this taiwan this is why we discuss these matters because there are certain uh Cycles. patterns which happen in a cyclic manner like you say mm. and we may be seeing something very similar today also again you know you know this is why when young students say oh why should i study history what's the point of history one it teaches you the art of storytelling two it teaches you how to predict the future of your own race yes so it is very important and that's why even i want to revise this world war Two and World War One kind of history. Okay, I'll let you continue, sir. What happened? Right. So the the Archduke Franz Ferdinand was was assassinated in Sarajevo. What happens is that the Austro-Hungarian Empire blames uh, Serbia for that. Russia says we are allies with Serbia. Austro-Hungary asks Germany, "Is it okay if you go to war with Serbia?" <laughs> I say, "Go ahead, go ahead." Mm-hmm. So they declare war on Serbia in uh, July, end of July, nineteen uh, fourteen. They try to attack Serbia. They they bombard Serbia, but it doesn't work. the serbs resist stoutly fiercely and that goes nowhere but now what happens is that germany takes the opportunity they they declare war i mean kind of declare war on two sides uh, on on russia and on france now the germany france region there there's a whole old history there the germans uh, had annexed some part of france in the last war in the 19th century so the french had some some uh, debts to pay there but the german france border was very well fortified there were very strong french fortifications so the germans went through luxembourg and belgium mm. the moment they enter belgium the british said we have assured belgium's neutrality you have broken that so we need to get involved in this so the british get involved they sent troops to france and all that So that's what happens now. The Germans, there's something called the Schlieffen Plan. The the Schlieffen Plan was that Germany would advance through Luxembourg, through Belgium, from the north, and then invade France and take Paris. So that happens. They go through Belgium. There's a very strong Belgian res- resistance. Then the British also get involved. Then these guys come all the way into France, and there is this the Battle of the Marne River. There's a river called the Marne. Terrible, terrible battle. And then they try to take Paris, doesn't work out, and then over time, what happens is that there is trench warfare that happens. So both sides dig in, they create tren- trenches, and these trenches they go from the North Sea all the way to Switzerland. Mm. You you gotta give a little context on trenches. So trench warfare. So what happens is that both sides they dig trenches 
against each other mm. maybe they are 50 meters apart maybe 100 meters apart you can hear the other side talking but you are dug dug into your trenches and then you can fight each other for months at a time mm. it's terrible it's oppressive there are rats there are dead bodies it's you can't remove them it's horrific disease disease of all kinds and typhus and cholera and what not mm. so this is what happened on the western front the line was frozen for for a very long time on the eastern front what happens is that the ottoman empire allies with germany with austro-hungary and they declare war on russia mm. so in the caucasus region they try to invade russia doesn't work it's a disaster the troops freeze to death in the thousands tens of thousands ottoman troops mm. that doesn't work they try to bomb odessa sevastopol these places which are currently at war right now so the ottoman empire tries to do that doesn't work then the british land an indian expeditionary force in kuwait in to take to try and take mesopotamia present day iraq that kind of ends in a disaster our people die in that uh fighting the ottoman empire fighting the ottoman empire on on the side of the british mr mr mohandas gandhi was actively involved in recruiting millions of indian soldiers for this i think about a million and a half indian soldiers fought for the british in this war mm. right so so the, what yeah. happens is that there is internationalization of the conflict yeah um you know that's actually what's not spoken about yes even in indian textbooks i remember studying world war 1 and world war 2 once in the 5th grade once in about i think the 8th or 9th grade mm -hmm. and nowhere was it mentioned that there was a lot of indian troops i won't say indian i'll call it brown troops subcontinental troops involved in these battles and how when they say british took part it was heavily actually uh, subcontinental troops there was a lot of subcontinental involvement in this british india about a million and a half indian troops british raj troops fought for the british died for the british mm. then there was a british attempt to uh, reinforce the russian position mm. to do that they had to go through the turkish straits this was a plan hatched by winston churchill so there are two narrow choke points in turkey the dardanelles and the bosphorus the bosphorus straits and the Dar dardanelles strait mm. so the british tried to land an expeditionary force at the dardanelles that ended in complete disaster because of a turkish general called mustafa kemal who became the eventually the dictator and the father of modern turkey mm. so this guy stopped the british and he defeated the defeated them over many months of horrific fighting terrible fighting so the ottoman empire is involved they try to invade uh, egypt and take suez that again is defended by the british because they need that to for access to india and the ottoman empire fails there so there's a lot happening then germany and france are still fighting italy gets involved because they are on the side of the allies not on side of germany mm. and they start fighting the auto or the austro hungarian empire there is a certain river whose name i forget they fought like 12 15 500 800 battles there never moved so that went on for a very long time all kinds of sides are involved in this uh, so like in the same way that the british used uh, subcontinental troops i'm mm. dead sure they must have used all uh, like troops from other colonies as well yes yes uh, and similarly did the other european powers also bring all their colonies into play indeed that's why they now called it the first world war because okay. the germans they had possessions in africa uh togo land cameroon uh, german southwest africa which is now called namibia there was eastern uh, there was an eastern territory as well so all of this got involved the french had many many possessions colonies in africa they recruited about a million soldiers black african soldiers from there and made them fight in the european war so everything got involved the germans had possessions in the pacific islands that they possessed the japanese got involved the japanese were on the side of the british this, at this time in world war 1 the japanese took over various german islands and possessions and a german possession in china as well australia and new zealand took over some other german territories in in the asia pacific region so everything got involved here the whole world is kind of involved in this other part. than south america other than south america yes there was action near south america also german warships they fought the british uh, navy near the falkland islands mm. and there was a battle naval battle there was also so everywhere there is something or the other happening some action happening then what happens is even bulgaria got involved in this on the side of the germans and austro hungary and then austria hungary and bulgaria together invades in 1915 they invade uh, serbia and they defeat serbia serbia the serbians have to escape through albania and, and get out of the country so the serbia was destroyed defeated and lot is happening over here the germans had a very powerful navy they had pioneered undersea warfare they had submarines called u boats they used to operate in wolf packs and mm. they the british imposed a naval blockade on germany the germans used submarines to fight the british navy wow. yeah the americans were supplying britain with all kinds of materials 
all kinds of foods because there was a war going on. They, there was no means to produce all of that in Europe. So the Americans were supplying Britain with this. The Germans went into the Atlantic and they started sinking the American ships. Mm. Mm. So America gets pulled into the war now. So America protested. Then they, the Germans toned it down for some time. But then they saw that the British are being reinforced constantly by the, by the Americans. So by 1916, 1917, the Germans again went all out and started attacking all these supply ships. Now, what happened here is that the Americans, they were helping the, the allied powers through uh, sending them arms, ammunition and food. Because of this, the allied powers, especially Britain, became heavily indebted to the Americans because they were buying all this on credit and they would eventually have to pay it back. So eventually the Americans got fed up of the German uh, thing and they also got involved in the war. Then the Americans got involved. They slowly entered the fray in Europe and slowly the whole thing was shattered. The Ottomans surrendered. The Austria-Hungary Empire also surrendered and eventually the Germans had were made to surrender. There was a revolution in Russia in 1917. Two revolutions. The, in the first revolution, the Tsar was forced to abdicate and a provisional government came to power. They continued the war. Mm. Then there was a second revolution, a Bolshevik revolution, which eventually gave rise to the USSR. Mm. And after the Bolshevik revolution happened, the, they, they said we will not fight. So the lines were frozen on the eastern side. The, the Germans and the Russians, they, they signed an agreement, no more fighting. The Russians were able to concentrate on the West, but eventually they were defeated there. So then there was this uh, armistice, the Treaty of Versailles, in which the Russians were not involved, the Germans were not, in, not, in, not involved. The Ottoman Empire was destroyed, divided into small pieces. Yeah. And there was a Turkish, uh, Turkish war of independence that Mustafa Kemal Ataturk fought and won because of which Turkey is one single country. Otherwise, it would have been broken into pieces. Mm. The Austro-Hungarian Empire was, was dismantled. Austria came out of it. Hungary came out of it. Various other states, Czech, Czech Republic, Slovak Republic and so much more was carved out of this Austro-Hungarian Empire. Germany lost lots of territory. The country of Poland was created out of this and including some Russian uh, possessions. The Russian Germans were blamed solely for the entire war. Mm. They were made to pay very, very heavy reparations to the other powers which they had fought with. And this was a complete humiliation. And a young Austrian soldier fought on the side of Germany. Yes. And that's where the seeds of World War II were planted. Yes. So the Treaty of Versailles was a disastrous thing for Germany. Big humiliation. This man, Adolf Hitler, fought in the World War I. He carried that humiliation with him. The German army was reduced to 100,000 soldiers maximum, uh, no more air force and, and, and all kinds of restrictions were placed on Germany, right? And and the villain here for Germans was Big Daddy Britain back then, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah, Britain was the one that's, uh, that uh, gained a lot out of this. Yeah. Mm. And uh, yeah, so there were a number of powers, Britain, France, etc., who all were part of the Treaty of Versailles. And then something came out of this, which was the League of Nations, which was kind of the precursor to the UN. Mm. But uh, the US was not part of it because the US Congress did not ratify the Treaty of Versailles or something. Mm. Now what happens is that uh, in the post-war era, Germany is not destroyed because none of the fighting has happened on German soil. So they are able to uh, restart their industries, which were already start going on. But because of the enormous reparations they have to pay every year, the economy is stuttering. Uh, the German mark becomes deeply devalued. Like it becomes like one trillionth of its original value, hyperinflation. Yeah. Then the Americans even send loans to Germany to repay the reparations. What was uh, in store for America back then when World War One was happening? I'm sure there must have been some motivation to even take part in the war or to help Britain. It can't be as simple as, oh, you know, whatever, you, you, we were allies once upon a time. There's got to be some economic angle. They were the China of back then in some ways. So the Americans are the original capitalists. Mm. everything is money. They saw a great opportunity to, to make money, mm. right? So they sent, they had this limitless land in which they produced all these crops like wheat and all that. So they sent lots of that to Europe to sustain the allied forces and lots of arms and ammunition, weapons and all that. They sent to the Britain and France and these countries, right? So uh, they benefited a lot from this. They became the major economic power in the world mm. after the end of World War One. By the time the World War ended, they were the major economic power in the world and they had limitless resources, right? Then you had the German economy went down. There was hyperinflation. Then there was a Wall Street crash of 1929 in New York, in, in Wall Street. That caused ripples all over the world and the German economy suffered a lot again because of that. In the 1920s, there was a rise of fascism in Italy. 
Benito mm. Mussolini came to power. He, he quickly became a one party dictator that sort of thing. So there was this event happening here. In the 1930s uh the National Socialist Party came to power in Germany because the the government the Weimar Republic government was blamed for all the ills of the economy. So Adolf Hitler became the undisputed boss very rapidly. He started he broke the Treaty of Versailles. He started remilitarization, conscription, uh starting the production of new arms and air force and all that and he went on this uh, uh campaign against the Jews. Yeah, I have to once again mention the iconic TRS line which I think you had mentioned and Joe Rogan's also mentioned it. We actually learned it from Joe Rogan. Tough times create hard men, hard men create easy times, easy times create soft men, soft men create tough times. It's a cycle, never ending yeah. cycle. And if within a span of 20 years I'm guessing from World War 1 to World War 2 there was this cycle that yes. happened in Germany. Adolf yeah. Hitler as evil as he is and uh, you know as bad as um history tells us that he is uh he was a tough man to rise as the single dictator in germany and i'd say the same probably for mussolini yes so italy felt humiliated italy felt it got nothing out of world war 1 it had territorial ambitions it wanted parts of the balkans uh, it wanted uh, territories in africa it had some it wanted more it it the italians felt they got nothing out of the war even though they bled so much against austria so there was this great discontent which gave rise to nationalism and the fascist party of benito mussolini came to power similarly germany was deeply humiliated the people were hurt their pride was wounded nationalism again and the strong man comes to power adolf hitler who promises that we will regain the world and we will regain our lost prestige and all that and hitler wanted territories he wanted what he called lebensraum which is extra land for the german people mm. right so he wanted an expansion of germany so he restarted the conscription of the army he restarted the military industries he stopped payment of reparations and britain and france only protested weakly they had weak governments so he was further emboldened by this yes i'm going to do it so then the preparations again begin so the Treaty of Versailles was nothing but a ceasefire a temporary ceasefire a 20 year ceasefire so germany then becomes more and more powerful the nazi party also exists in austria so they come to power and they unify austria and germany so germany is now expanded now the germans want czech territory student sudeten land or something they called it in which you had a german majority population so they had designs on that the british and the french kind of allowed that theek okay, you go and do that but please don't do more so the germans take that over then within no time they go and take over half of czechoslovakia and the slovak republic becomes a vassal state or a satellite state of germany then the germans sign a no aggression play, pact with stalin hitler and stalin it was called the molotov ribbentrop pact i think it was in 38 or 39 and the secret clause is that we will divide up poland so poland was an independent country at the time then the germans uh, attack poland they take over half of it the rest half is taken by the ussr and then that is a declaration of war once they invade poland the british and the french declare war thanks for watching make sure you check out the entire episode and also check out this playlist that we've curated just for you